you didn't catch last week's video, I showed you around our new 57 foot narrowboat. Well, this week, I think it's about time that I shared our experience of buying a narrowboat. So keep on watching. Firstly, well before even buying this, we'd been eyeing up narrowboats for a long time, quite a few years. So when we got married, we thought, why not have a honeymoon on a narrowboat just so we can see what it was like? And it was about 40 foot long. The bedroom was at the front with no door and the dinette and kitchen was at the back. And we found that we loved the experience so much traveling along the Langothlan Canal or Langolan Canal and we decided that's how we wanted to spend our Christmas too. And our second hire boat experience, it wasn't as nice. It was quite run down, a similar size, but the living room or the saloon was at the front, the bedroom was at the back. And we instantly could tell that the fact that the dog was jumping on the bed with muddy paws and we couldn't shut off that room, this layout really wasn't gonna be for us. Plus the kitchen was too far away to be sociable while one's cooking, the other one's driving. Or there's times where you need to communicate with each other, particularly when you've never done this before, to say, Vicky, I need you to go and drive while I go and hop off and do a lock. Or Vicky, we've got to do this, that or the other. So yeah, that's why we much preferred the idea of a reverse layout where the kitchen was at the back. We also preferred the idea of a cruiser or a semi-cruiser stern so you could have more than one person stood at the back while driving plus we've got a dog manoeuvring around our legs and traditional sterns are much smaller and that, again I don't think they'd be as sociable if you have a few people on board. So I think it's generally a good idea to test these boats out first to get an idea because they don't seem to be getting any cheaper in fact, I think they're a little bit more expensive now than what they used to be this time last year. You've also got to consider things like whether you'll be okay with land sickness if you get it because I had it for 10 days after our first narrowboat experience and my husband didn't get anything at all. And I remember after just two or three days of being on the boat, we decided to take a cycle to the, um, the Telford Inn pub in Trevor from the Langollen Basin we'd sat down for a meal outside and I said to my husband the ground isn't rocking is it and it was such a really weird experience and you can feel a little bit queasy with it like your body is attuned to a slow pace with a bit of rocking it's so surreal with the second hire boat I still got it but not as long then when we actually bought the boat I had it again probably about seven or ten days but it's not come back since touch wood and it feels so long ago now but when we came back from our last hire experience and that was January 2020 I think it was a few months after that obviously the the lockdown started we began to remotely look for narrowboats and reverse layouts in 57 feet don't come up very often. They seem to be really, really popular. And you might be wondering why we wanted to go for 57 feet because we'd only been used to 40 odd feet. And that is because it is a daunting experience when you see the length of any boat. But when you're on it and you try it for a bit, you realize actually I don't think 57 feet is gonna be much different. And we wanted a future proof it for having two desks on here as well. So we needed as much space that we could have. However, we didn't want a boat that was too wide or long either, meaning we couldn't explore all of the canals. And in an ideal world, we would have loved to have driven to loads of different brokerages, but at the same time, we knew what we were looking for. And anything that was advertised online anyway, tend to go much quicker and pricey than the local areas that we found. And that's exactly how we found this, a local boat at a local brokerage. And it was a reverse layout, not too old, 10 years. It was a bit cheaper than the other ones we'd seen online. And at first glance, there didn't seem to be a great deal of work that needed doing to it. And I don't know how common this is, but all of the boats at this brokerage were advertised with a four year boat safety certificate. And that was all down to the sellers 
having to do any final tweaks to, to get that sorted. And we left it about a week to mentally process things like where would a washing machine go, any other changes that would make. And when we returned, having slept on a few things, this time we went to listen to the engine, test the diesel heater, but we spotted more things that we hadn't noticed the previous week, like some water staining around the windows that told us there might have been leaking. And we had a really good look underneath all the cupboards to see if there were any signs of water damage and things until the point where we were happy to start negotiating and give our final offer subject to survey. Now, one thing I would never do in that is buy a boat without a survey. And what we'd got back was a very intense 18 pages front and back. No, okay, not front and back, but 18 pages. And it's pretty intense stuff. But to start this process, we first paid for a 10% deposit that was refundable and you had to pay a fee to get it out of the water. And on the day the surveyor was due to be there, I gave it an hour or two and then went along just to get a feel for how it was going. And apparently it was almost like new. It had also been treated with a two-pack epoxy, including the bottom as opposed to bitumen, which I'm told is more hard wearing and a little bit more expensive. I also got a lesson to never put bitumen on top of this stuff if you want to put the two-pack epoxy on later because apparently it needs to be grit blasted off to, to start all over again. And another thing that the surveyor found underneath was a little bit of pitting, but it appears to have been epoxied over after. Another thing that I watched him do was to test for any loose framing or filled areas by running around certain sections with the edge of a hammer and then listening while he tapped. He'd scrape a little bit of the marine growth with the end of a chisel, then he could test with the probe to see how thick the hull was and write a load of numbers on the blacking with chalk. He did seem to think that the size of the anodes were a bit overkill, but we have since found pictures of this moored up at Hull Marina near the salty water by the estuary. So that could explain why it was so big. And this is where he started to point out things like a missing hull fitting, rusty fender pin holders, little things that needed to be changed. And when it came to the inside of the boat, I decided to leave him to it because of COVID restrictions and I didn't want to interrupt him because we were paying him to do a job. But in short, he discovered things like a cracked shower tray, a leaking bathroom tap. I'll leave a link to that video repair below and a handful of things to make sure it had its boat safety certificate. But I wasn't happy with a few of the things which I wanted to get them sorted as part of the deal, like the cracked shower tray they sorted for me. It's just that when we committed to buying the boat, it was somewhere that I wanted to get away from DIY. I wanted to be able to relax on it. And that's what my offer reflected. So what I'm saying is when you do put an offer in, just expect that there may be things to have to pay for and do up that you might not have expected. And after the survey, something that didn't completely sit well with me was agreeing to black somebody else's boat. Yes, it would have saved us money by not paying for it again to be taken out of the water. But if that sale didn't go ahead for any reason or jobs weren't done to how we wanted, we might have ended up having to pay for somebody else's boat to be blacked. And so there were a huge element of trust there. I suppose I would have really thought twice if it was a really expensive quote, but I did offer to help out. It looked a lot of fun. They said no due to health and safety, but I'm sure I'll get to do that one day. And our whole buying process took about six weeks from the moment we paid our deposit to when we got the keys. And I know it will vary for everyone. And ours was particularly longer because we had things done to it to get the certificate and we paid for a full engine service. But the next thing that we had to worry about was where were we gonna moor it? Obviously we, we looked into this before we committed to completely buying it because you don't wanna buy a boat and then you're stuck with where to put it. And I rang around loads of different places and what you'll find, or at least in this area, is that many places are cheaper providing you've got to muck in and volunteer doing some maintenance jobs and stuff every few days a month or help out at the club bar. We didn't want any of that. We wanted something close to us 
and pay for somewhere where we could completely relax at weekends. So we found somewhere very close. Pulling into the marina for the first time though is possibly one of the most embarrassing experiences ever, particularly when you've never driven a 57 foot narrowboat and you assume everybody's watching, everybody's laughing and everyone's experienced boaters. Although after a few weeks, we found out some of them have never even been out of the marina. So that is quite a relief, but we're getting better and we've now got a 14 foot ash pole just in case, which has been a savior. Although it might be a 12 foot ash pole. <laughs> and finally, we got to the stage of unpacking things, finding leaks under the sink. Not what you want to do on your first day. Looks like there's plumber's tape there, which I wouldn't have done. This is going to be gross. Actually, it's not, it doesn't even feel that tight. I've lost hands. Where do you think he is, though? What are you doing in there? I think he's nervous because we haven't got everything sorted out yet. But he's right next to a plumbing water catcher. What's the matter? Are you frightened? I won't bore you with the details. I just needed a washer and a 38 to 40 mil reducer. So it's that that's leaking now. This it's a bit of water on me now. Yeah. It's different plumbing under the main sink. And also had to start thinking about adding corks to all of our keys. Ah, uh, yay, look. Tape two, tape top. Floating lanyards to our waterproof phones. Anyway, I hope you found this video useful. And if you've got any questions, let me know below. I'm looking forward to sharing the rest of our journey. Thanks for watching. Bye. I can't believe, I love my husband so much. I really appreciate him more every day. I'm so lucky. I don't know how many times you've put this in because I deleted it once. We had a really good rummage. Oh, <laughs> rummage. So hot. It was somewhere I wanted to come and relax at weekends or exit. <sighs> Have a sip of coffee and shut up. Mm -hmm. And I'd offered as well to help out. 